Yeah. So, hello everyone. Uh, today's talk is by Sai, Sai Sandeep uh, on uh, a conditional hardness of coloring three colorable graphs with a constant number of colors. It's all yours. Uh, hi, uh, this talk will be about uh, DT1 hardness of coloring three colorable graphs and this joint work with Swenkert from CMU. And the talk is going to be relatively shorter, so feel free to interrupt for any questions. So we are interested in the three coloring problem. So the problem is that given a graph and you want to know whether it's uh, three colorable or not. And it's one of the uh, classical NP hard problems. So we are interested in approximation algorithms for this problem. So that is uh, given a graph that is promised to be three colorable. And now can we color it with uh, let's say four colors or like hundred colors in polynomial time. And there have been uh, uh, some uh, really nice algorithmic works on this problem, starting with uh, uh, Victorson's work in 83, where he showed that you can color a, uh, such a graph that is promised to be three colorable with square root 10 colors. And there have been uh, some improvements over this, uh, primarily using STP rounding based technique. And since that, so far, we are able to get it to something a little less than n to the 0.2 uh, order of into the point to colors. But this talk is going to be about uh, hardness. So what do we know on the hardness side? So we know that you can color it with uh, into the point to uh, so many colors. And uh, and for the hardness, it's uh, easy to think in terms of the decision version. So uh, and the decision version is the same, given a graph and you want to distinguish between the two cases. Yes, case, uh, it can be colored with three colors. And in the no case, it cannot even be colored with uh, some C greater than three colors. So, and uh, for this problem with uh, this, uh, like with small C equal to three is just the hardness of uh, graph three colors. And uh, it, unfortunately, uh, like uh, even though there has been significant progress in the algorithmic front, the hardness side actually hasn't seen much work. And it's only very recently, uh, and in a breakthrough work, uh, this uh, even like small, uh, like the C equal to five case is resolved. And and it, it's still the best uh, known. So we don't even know if uh, we haven't yet ruled out coloring the graph that is promised to be three colorable with six colors. And so to get around this barrier, people have tried to look at conditional results. So conditional results are like assume some sort of uh, hardness conjecture, and then you want to prove that uh, graph coloring is hard as well. And usually many of these conditional results start uh, as in like are based on unique games conjecture. But however, for our problem, uh, unique games conjecture doesn't work because uh, we need perfect completeness. That is in the yes case, uh, we need the graph to be all the edges are, uh, like the, the coloring is a valid, property coloring, it's not like a, a few fraction of the edges are violated or something. But uh, similar to unique games country, there are other conjectures uh, that do have perfect completeness, and we'll be focusing on those uh, conjectures. And but, uh, and so one of them is this uh, a D to one conjecture, and uh, D could be anything, and so, Assuming two to one conjecture, uh, so later I'll explain what all these conjectures mean. And assuming two to one conjecture, uh, it's already been proved uh, in, in a nice part of Junior, Mosul, and Raja that uh, four versus C coloring is NPR for every C. And even three versus C is also proved to be in NPR, assuming a fish shaped uh, version of the unique games conjecture. And and like uh, b before uh, going forward, I will explain what all these conjectures mean. Um, all these conjectures are variants of uh, this label cover problem. And in the label cover problem, you have uh, a bipartite graph G with uh, let's say the L R and uh, edges, uh, and there are constraints across the edges. So you could think of it as this uh, as a binary CSP, but with a special form of constraint. Each constraint is a projection constraint. That is, once you uh, fix the value of a vertex on the left, the value of the uh, vert vertex on the right that is adjacent to it is uniquely determined if you want to satisfy that edge. And uh, this this has been a classical problem in the field of hardness approximation, and many of the hardness results uh, follow from this problem. 
and we do know a uh, very good uh, hardness for this so like uh, by the time mean, you we know that it's np hard to distinguish between the two cases in the first case when all the constraints are satisfied versus the uh, utmost epsilon fraction of the constraint can be satisfied for any constant epsilon and uh, we do require perfect completeness uh, um, in the sense that uh, by by perfect completeness i mean that in the completeness case all the constraints are satisfied as opposed to saying that uh, at most some delta fraction of constraints are violated and uh, so this all uh, the con the conjectures that i mentioned previously they are all variants of this label cover problem they are all saying that uh, a certain structured form of label cover is also hard and one of the such uh, conjectures is this uh, so called d21 conjecture and d21 conjecture has been introduced by code in the same paper that introduced the unique games conjecture and in the d21 conjecture you have uh, the label set on the left side is uh, let's say d times l on the right side itself and uh, we do know that for every uh, label on the left there is unique label on the right that satisfies the condition but in the d21 conjecture the other direction is also true but with the d label so for every label on the right there are exactly d labels on the left that satisfy a particular edge so if you if you think of d as one that's just a unique games conjecture but the advantage of having larger d is that you can you can also have perfect completeness and this uh, so now you can have increasing d and different forms of the conjecture so the strongest uh, of these family of conjectures is a 2 to 1 conjecture and we actually prove that uh, the results that previously are known under the 2 to 1 conjecture which is the hardness of uh, 4 versus 6 but we prove that so the those hardness results in, even like 3 versus 3 like, we can obtain them assuming the d to 1 conjecture for any constant uh, d not just uh, d equal to 2 so the hope is that somehow uh, it it could it, it is probably easier to prove the d21 conjecture for a large constant d and then uh, you you get the this uh, 3 versus 3 coloring long standing problem and yeah so uh, as i mentioned earlier d equal to 2 case is uh, proved in dinamosa ledger uh, only for like 4 versus 3 and we prove that it's in uh, arbitrary also uh, at this point i'll remark that uh, there has been uh, uh, some uh, nice recent work that showed the 2 to 1 conjecture but with imperfect completeness uh, in a in a long uh, line of work they showed 2 to 1 conjecture but so but they don't get perfect completeness and perfect completeness is very crucial for us so, and the techniques seem to be uh, they seem to be using linear uh, type of uh, long code things so seems that they don't really extend to perfect completeness case Okay, so these are our main results, and uh, now we'll discuss how we go, go about proving it. So we do it in two steps. In first step, we prove that for any uh, positive integer d, d to one conjecture implies that uh, 2d versus c coloring is np hard. Uh, as in, like in the yes case, not uh, the graph is not three colorable; it's, it's uh, 2d colorable. And in the no case, of course, it's uh, C, uh, it cannot be colored C colored for any C. And we combine this with a, uh, a very nice recent work uh, due to Crock in Operational Watch and Disney, where they use this arc uh, graph, the chromatic, the properties of the chromatic number of arc graph to show that um, it, it essentially suffices to show the three versus C if you can show like uh, any constant versus C. Like if you want to show that three versus c is NP hard for every c, it's okay to show like any constant versus c. Like so, here we show that d to one implies that two d versus c, which uh, then implies by their result, uh, even three versus c coloring is hard as well. So in the rest of the talk, I'll just focus on this step one. And okay, so to to put everything together, so far what I have done is that we have introduced this D21, like we uh, explained this D21 conjecture, and, and you want to prove that that implies 3 versus C. And so the updated goal is that you want to show D versus D21 conjecture implies uh, 2D versus C uh, coloring is NPR for all C greater than equal to. And if you just put plug in D equal to, this is the same as the one that uh, Dino, Mosel, and Regular have proved. 
and the approach is the uh, we is the same approach uh, as uh, their uh, results and uh, which is to use label cover long curve based reduction and the key difference uh, from their work is that at uh, at, the point, at in their reduction they need to use a symmetric markov chain with some properties and that uh, we we generalize that object to any d which then implies the same hardness for any d and so before going further we just recall what a symmetric markov chain is uh, you just have the state space and the probability uh, of going from one state to other is the same as uh, i i to j is the same as going from j to i so you could just think of it as a n by n symmetric matrix with uh, non negative entries and sum of elements in each row and column of one so simply it's a symmetric double stochastic matrix and what are the properties that we need from it uh, for the reduction to work first we need that the support is disjoint so if there is a transition probability from u1 to ud to v1 to vd we need that the u1 to the sets uh, u1 to ud and v1 to vd are disjoint and second property that we need is that the spectral radius of this symmetric markov chain is less than one so this this essentially means that uh, there is only one eigen value with absolute value equal to one and so how do we construct such a symmetric markov chain in in the dinner muscle rega work when where they studied this problem with for d equal to 2 they constructed this matrix manually so they just uh, uh, showed some uh, states and some probability distribution and then worked out but we want to do it for any general d and how, so how do we do it so the technique that we use is this uh, matrix scaling so what is matrix scaling in the matrix scaling you have you first start with uh, some arbitrary matrix and in our case it's the uh, adjacent matrix of certain graph and in every step we scale either a row or a column of the matrix so so and the goal is to um, construct a double stochastic matrix at the end and you want to do it by uh, these row or column uh, operation how it then this leads to the question when does uh, such a such a series, so when when does there exist such a series of operations that gives us a double stochastic matrix and it's uh, it's been a, a pretty well studied topic and we know certain initial conditions of the original matrix that you are starting with under which uh, it's guaranteed that you will end up with a double stochastic matrix so to recall we we need uh, some properties from a markov chain and you want to we are trying to construct using adjacency matrix of a graph so now um, what are the conditions under which we know that it this thing terminates and one of one such condition is this the original matrix a has uh, total support and if you translate it Uh, that condition to uh, the matrices that are adjacency uh, matrices of a graph it uh, it translates to the condition that every edge of the graph is a part of a cycle cover cycle cover of a graph is just a union of uh, vertex disjoint cycles that cover all the vertices of the graph and so now uh, instead of requiring some properties from a uh, symmetric markov chain we now reduce the problem to requiring some properties from a graph with vertex set 2d raised to the d and what are the properties that we need from this graph first we need that every edge is part of a cycle cover this is to ensure that when we uh, apply the matrix scaling we we end up with a double stochastic uh, matrix and with the symmetric markov chain and we also need some other properties of the symmetric markov chain just to recall one we need the disjoint support property and two we also need the uh, spectral radius of that uh, to be less than one which translates to the property that the graph should be connected and it should not be uh, a bipartite graph so to summarize we need these three properties from this graph and the vertex set of the graph is uh, 2d raised to the d and now we show how to uh, construct such a graph so 
okay here q q is supposed to be 2d we add uh, two two types so we just start with the like, empty graph and we add two types of edges so the first type is uh, we add edge between u uh, which is u1 to ud and v equal to v1 to vd if uh, they are of the same ordering as in for every i comma j uh, they follow the same ordering as u1 equal to u uj if and only if uh, v v u i equal to u j if and only if v i equal to j and similarly uh, other conditions as well so in some sense we are uh, breaking the vertex set into equivalent classes and then adding uh, uh edges between vertices in the same class that have disjoint supports and the second types of uh, edges that we are add, adding are uh, the same as above for the case when u1 uh, are equal to ud like all all of them are equal so this this uh, is essentially ensures that uh, you have connectedness and the graph is also not bipartite so this to re so we already have uh, gotten two properties the connectedness and uh, non bipartiteness and since we are adding edges uh, between uh, vectors that have support disjoint anyway so we also have the disjointness property so the only property that we need to verify is that uh, this every edge of this graph is part of a cycle cover and that is uh, uh, not difficult to see because simply because um, the type one all the type one edges are uh, regular so this you when you uh, we fix a class of ordering which uh, which fix so and among that class is just a nessa graph because we are just adding edges between vertices that have disjoint support and they are regular so it and one every regular graph every edge in a regular graph is part of a cycle cover this is because you can just have two copies of the graph and then construct a bipartite graph and that bipartite graph is biregular so it has a perfect matching and so uh, every edge is uh, part, part of a, even more every edge will be part of perfect matching and so we can conclude that every edge is part of a cycle cover as well so we have constructed this we have showed the existence of this graph with all these properties which then implies the uh, uh, existence of this metric marker chain as well and now uh, finally uh, we'll just describe the reduction how do we go from this uh, symmetric marker chain to how do you use this symmetric marker chain in the reduction from uh, this d to one conjecture to graph coloring tool first we actually uh, re reduce this Uh, D to one conjecture to this other variant called D to D conjecture. So it's uh, it's proved that uh, D to one conjecture implies the D to D conjecture. So in the D to D conjecture, it's, so the constraints are no longer projections, but they have this very special uh, type of structure. So you could think of the alphabet uh, is some D times L, and there are two permutations phi one phi two. Uh, one for for every edge, uh, there are two uh, permutations: phi one, phi two. One for the vertex on the left, one for the vertex on the right. So is that uh, the the graph that is obtained by adding pairs that are in the relation is uh, of this form d to d. So phi one inverse x and phi two inverse y uh, belong to this d to d, and d to d is this relation. So essentially, you can think of it like There is this D to D structure, and then you you can permute the labels uh, on the left or on the right. So this is the D to D conjecture. This is uh, simply easier to work with. Uh, it's not hard to prove D to D conjecture from D to one conjecture. Okay, and so we also first we call what the uh, traditional label cover long chord uh, setup. so you have start with a label cover instance to uh, to recall you have a graph uh, and then uh, a constraint for every edge and then you want to output a new graph based on this label cover instance such that if the label cover instance is satisfiable the graph can be colored with 2d colors 
and if uh, no assignment can satisfy some epsilon prime fraction of the constraints in the label term uh, the new graph g prime cannot be colored with cyclic but we actually prove a strong statement that uh, is not even an independent set of size epsilon g prime and how do how do we go about this so we replace each vertex of the label cover with a set of nodes uh, fp of size uh, 2d to the dl this is a long code what is it and what are the edges that we add so if you look at every edge u comma v uh, an edge of the label cover instance so g with some projection uh, not projection the constraint uh, pi e which has uh, which is represented by the permutations pi 1 pi 2 pi 1 pi 2 are the ones that are present here and and we also have the symmetric markov chain that we have uh, constructed previously and we add it just uh, between x1 and xdl and y into ydl so is that uh, the so this this constraint it may look weird uh, when at uh, the first side when we are adding this uh, m of uh, all the d2 uh, d2 d set of uh, so you want the d2 d set you look at every pair uh, in the d2 d and then uh, for them the markov chain support should for that pair the markov chain support should be uh, it should be in the support of the markov chain so the idea is that uh, it essentially comes from the completeness case you want to ensure that when you decode each f e to a dictator function this uh, should be a valid 2d coloring which is uh, clear for us because uh, the the mark the m is has this property that uh, there are only uh, transient probability between two sets if their uh, support is disjoint and we also have additional properties of m which are useful in this soundness case so Okay, and how, how does the analysis go through? As I mentioned earlier, completeness is actually fairly straightforward. You just uh, suppose that in in the case that there is a labeling to the vertices of the label cover that satisfies all the constraints, you decode each node with the uh, the dictator function corresponding to that labeling, and this is a valid coloring simply because. Uh, uh when in the constraints that we have added okay yeah and so if you decode to uh to dictate the functions here uh the it just uh, will intersect so the support is non zero so in the graph that you get g prime it there are no uh it just between vertices that are assigned the same label so the graph g prime will be 2d color and the soundness analysis is uh, usually the harder uh, case and uh, how does the soundness work you know that there is a large uh, independent set in g prime and using that we want to show that there is a assignment uh, to the label cover that satisfies large fraction of the constraint and usually uh, and in this case we use uh, uh, invariance based principle to decode to the small set of labels and that that satisfy a constraint and how do we do that and okay let, let me before that i'll i'll state the invariance principle that we need here and uh, let t be a, a symmetric markov chain that with spectral radius one you have two different functions f and g and each of them have uh, reasonably high expected value and they have this property that the inner product of f and t g is non zero if if this property is true then uh, there is a coordinate where both the functions have uh, uh, reasonable low degree influence so low degree influence is a variant of uh, traditional influence where we only look at uh, the fourier coefficients with uh, a degree at most some particular value and this is this is very nice for us because we we could uh, decode to these low degree coordinates and and this uh, this principle this invariance principle based result this directly shows the consistency of the decoding so and okay to 
to just explain this decoding mechanism for for someone who have has not seen all these type of predictions usually uh the way these work is that uh, in the soundness case you sh show that uh, okay this csp whatever the graph coloring problem uh has some structured coloring let's say here there is a large independent effect uh using that we uh show some uh important coordinates or important labels to each uh, label cover vertex and then we once you sample a label from these uh, set of labels to each vertex we then show that this labeling the random sample labeling satisfies a constant fraction of the edges which is uh, which then proves that there is a labeling uh, to the label cover instance that satisfies a constant fraction of edges which is a which is a contradiction so that which is exactly what we want and here the labeling is the, all the coordinates of the so the functions f and g are the independent set uh, functions they have high expected value because overall they have uh, high uh, we know that epsilon fraction is an independent set and you could just uh, look at a like epsilon by 2 uh, we know that there are epsilon by 2 uh, fraction of labels that have epsilon by 2 expected value so we can just stick to them and the decoding is the set of coordinates that have high uh, low degree influence and this k the the degree like the degree of the low degree influence is obtained from the epsilon itself and the so the consistency of the decoding is uh, follows from exactly this result so we know that uh, for every edge these labels uh, intersect uh, based on the constraint so the the final part that we need to prove is that uh, these labels there are not too many labels that is actually fairly straightforward because you just have that uh, sum of low degree influence is at most k so that k is also a function of epsilon so overall the number of decoded coordinates is just a function of epsilon and that that concludes the proof as you you now have uh, decoding to some f of epsilon uh, coordinates which uh, which then which is a consistent decoding then you 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 prove that there is a labeling that satisfies some f of epsilon fraction of the constraint and that that uh, pretty much the whole uh, result so to conclude uh, we showed that d21 conjecture implies c versus c uh, for every d and there are uh, several interesting questions one is that uh, i think the most important is this whether what 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 function of d the soundness need to be uh that that seems to be the key there like somehow you may not need uh epsilon to be uh like can you characterize what function of d the epsilon need to be for this result to work that will be very interesting and the other question is recently there have been some interesting uh baby pcp type of work whether such baby d to one implies 3 to c is also uh, very interesting as is the proof uh, in the proof four step itself we uh, we only take uh, a particular some fraction of the vertices of the label cover and that step breaks down if you have baby d to 1 so that that is also very interesting if there is some other way to somehow show that baby d to 1 could imply 3 versus c coloring hardness yeah and and for people who haven't seen this baby did one you can you can ignore ignore it yeah and that that's that's it yeah thanks yeah i was it was quicker than i expected yeah you are quite quick so we have a lot of time for questions yeah also. questions yeah so uh, i wanted to ask uh, exactly the the question uh, well the thing you discussed uh, the last so maybe yeah so I know I know that you use these you know fractions and how uh, important yeah yeah mm -hmm. do you think it's like anyhow plausible that that this step can be avoided in your proof you know no, when I, I read the paper, somewhat... it doesn't look like it to me but uh, does does it seem like possible at all yeah even for us it seems somehow it's inherent that we need the existing. But but I don't know how you would prove such a thing. Like 
that you need this, but it seems yeah, yeah sure, sure. I mean, it's not uh, yeah. it's just asking about your feeling because my feeling yeah, yeah. We uh, I think we did spend some time, but it seems that you you do need the full power of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Can you please go yeah. back to uh, this reduction from label cover to to the three coloring? Because well, mm -hmm. when I read the paper, it it was clear, and now actually the graph seemed bipartite to me. Right, oh. so, you, so you start with the bipartite graph. The, isn't this graph bipartite actually? Oh yeah, actually I I, I that's the slight thing. Since we are only dealing with D to D, so then the original graph need not be bipartite. All right, so you essentially need yeah. non-bipartite inputs, otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good approach. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just confused me a bit. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah, so D to one, you need. Uh, um, I think that actually explains why you have to go from D to one to D to D. Yeah, D to one, you you are forced to have bipartite because there are two types of labels, right? In D to D, there is no such uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, okay, uh, so again, but but if you. Uh, restrict D to D to bipartite. You are still getting. Yeah, I think this reduction shouldn't work in that case. And so, so the reduction cannot work. So I mean, that's now I'm still confused. I think. No. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Isn't it that like D to D? If you restrict to bipartite inputs, it will just be easy for small enough epsilon. Like unique games conjecture does not make sense if you if you require the graph to be bipartite, right? Or am I wrong? No, unique games is okay, right? On bipartite. It says that I think this reduction doesn't hold I feel. Right. Okay, yeah. I don't know. We cannot hear you, Venkat. Oh, you might be muted. Uh, shouldn't be muted. Now, I was saying you can also put these edges inside a long code. Uh, so we did not hear you, Venkat. For, uh, please, can you repeat what you said? Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was saying you could you could also put these disjoint messages inside a long code table. Right. Yeah, but are we using that somewhere you here? Can, but you must then, or, or what? Yeah, 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 I guess you must uh, in some sense. Um, I mean, in the usual way you convert unique games to D to D is you sample two neighbors. Yeah, and then, add, and then you do yeah. it with replacement. So there is a chance you will sample, you know, in fact, you will sample the same long code twice yeah. and you will have D2D constraints between them. So right. So so this is not probably like, what is happening under the hood. So yeah, so so this is not what uh, actually the reduction does exactly, right? That's... No, it's just that the D2D oh. uh, starting point is non-bipartite. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. But the question whether D2D on bipartite instances has an algorithm that that is bothering me. It probably doesn't, right? No, no. Okay. My question is. Yeah. Now, now, I mean, is this the the reduction you actually do or or not? No. <laughs> no, this is the no, reduction no. that we do. I'm sure, but no, the no, starting but I point also. Is... I think it, it, there is some implicit structure, right? Because you could also have a D two D thing. Forget bipartite or anything. You don't even need bipartite. If it has an independent set of size epsilon, that itself will be enough, right? So somehow you need this density type fact that any epsilon fraction of vertices will have some, some epsilon square constraints between them. And you, you get that by 
sampling uh, you take a unique game which is d or d to one and then you do the sampling of two neighbors i think and then you have you don't have any of these issues uh, right so because somewhere in the soundness you will you will have to say that on those epsilon fraction where you have good mass there are enough edges so you will actually get a good assignment for the d21 and i think there it will break down if it's bipartite right maybe i didn't explain so, so you, you, go you, back think, to, you think the bipartite version of uh of no, no, bipartite will not work in fact you will need something even stronger you will need a property like in the constraint graph it should be dense in the sense that if you take epsilon fraction of uh, variables there should be some you know epsilon cube constraints within them which in particular rules out of course bipartite or any even largest independent set and i think that's kind of tacitly used in the soundness right so so d21 uh, d2d with, uh, for bipartite is actually easy that's what you're saying Because I'm not sure I'm saying that, but I'm saying the reduction will okay, not. Okay, I, I I understand. I understand what you said. But then I think still like either uh, D to D is easy or this reduction like. But bipartite won't be easy because even D to one is not easy, right? So, on bipartite. So, uh, Libor, I think uh, in this reduction we are somehow implicitly assuming that every epsilon fraction of the vertices have uh, enough edges. because we are ah uh, 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 okay, okay okay now i understand it you need some assumptions yeah. on the d2d yeah. oh, okay yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. and the reduction from d to 1 to d2d actually satisfies those so we don't need to worry about it yeah and that's actually the place where the baby version also breaks down because you have to use that some some like you are missing out some edges Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, so maybe we can move to another question. Um, you can ask a question about those conjectures. Um, so, is there any conjecture that is weaker than um, all of those D two ones, or you know that's uh, there's nothing weaker? So that's just as weak as you you can go. Yeah, the 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 baby D two one is one of them, but the, I among the popular ones, I don't think there's any anything else that is weaker. Okay. Some more questions? Okay. There are no more questions. Uh, let's thank Sai again.